Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for receiving me back again in Trieste. It's a pleasure to be here. And everything that I'm going to talk about is a joint work with Federico Rodriguez Hertz. Okay. So I'll be working in the following setting. I'm going to consider a compact metric space and F an homeomorphism of it. And I will be interested in the thermodynamic formalities that you can associate to these systems. And in particular, I'll be paying attention to the concept of topological pressure. Instead of giving you the definition by n epsilon volts and using exponential sums, I'm going to save some time and I'm going to use directly the variational principle. So let me denote by PFM, the set of all F invariant Borel probability measures of M. And for a given continuous map, just a real value map, which in this part of the theory are usually called potentials, you define the topological pressure as the following quantity. You take an invariant measure, you look at the entropy of the map F, and you add the integral of phi respect to nu, and then you take the supremum among, among all possible invariant measures. That's the topological pressure. Then, let me define what is an equilibrium state. An equilibrium state for the potential phi is simply a measure such that the previous supremum is attained, namely for the topological, the topological pressure of F is equal to the, the entropy of F plus with respect to nu plus the integral of I respect to nu. You can think of that you can define in some sense that thermodynamic formalism, at least in equilibrium, is precisely the study of equilibrium states. And we will be interested in questions as the following. Do they e exist? I give you a F and I give you phi. Can you find an equilibrium state? Well, it happens that this part of the theory is, in some sense, uh, the easiest to deal with due to very general methods. I'm going to put here the name of Bowen, and it's meant to be in an illustrative tone. There are many people who have worked in this. I cannot give you a complete bibliography, but it's just a sample, OK? General methods, what I mean by general methods is, I'll give you an example. If you were yesterday in the talk of Radu, he looked at this map. You fix F, and you look at the map that, for an invariant measure, it gives you the entropy of F. And he was talking about what happens with these guys upper semi-continuous. OK? So if this map is upper semi-continuous, adding an integral, fixed integral, or, or, or an integral of a fixed function is also upper semi-continuous, because this function is continuous with respect to the measure. Now, the Borel probability measures comprise a compact metric space, and you have an upper semi-continuous function of it, so it has a maximum. So, in this way, you prove very simply that equilibrium state exists. But it doesn't tell you anything about the equilibrium state. Now, if you have existence, you may wonder about uniqueness. Here, you also have general, but general methods, but they are a little bit more restricti restrictive. You have to put some conditions, otherwise you won't, you won't hold. And here, Again, you can the very classical work. You have the very classical work of Bowen, or more recently, Klimenaga and Thompson have been working this part of the, of the theory. And then, once that you have existence, uniqueness, you discuss uniqueness, you are interested in properties or description of equilibrium states. And for this, I mean the following: say, if your equilibrium state mixing, is it Bernoulli? That is, is it your system homeomorphic to flipping a coin? Maybe your coin has many faces. Maybe your faces are not uh, equiprobable. 
But still, this is a, essentially the most random system that you can think of. And also the decay of correlations that was discussed previously in the, in the lecture of Federico. Okay? I'm writing properties description because to have these properties, you need to know something about the equilibrium state. Those, the general methods usually don't tell you anything. Yeah. Now, I'm going to leave the general theory, and I'm going to concentrate in the part of the theory, the theory that I'm interested in, which is a smooth ergodic theory. In a smooth ergodic theory, I'm going to assume that M is a manifold, and F is a diffeomorphism. And I'm going to tell you about one of the most important theorems in a smooth dynamical systems. It's the following. If you have an hyperbolic attractor of F, and I'm assuming transitivity, then for every Helder potential, there exists a unique equilibrium state for a restriction of F to, to lambda. Now, I'm asking a little bit more than continuity, but that's not too much, right? It's just Helder. And if you assume a further property, that is that F restricted to lambda is topologically mixing, then your system is metrically isomorphic to our Nullishif. Names that are related. So this the first part is essentially due to Senior, Ruil, and Bowen. And for the last part, you need the, ar the arguments of the Orstein theory. That part essentially is Orstein and Weiss and Bowen also. Okay? This is a very important theorem. Give me a couple of, let's give you a couple of examples. If phi is equal, identically equal to zero, then use the entropy maximization. And if phi is minus the logarithm of the determinant of f restricted to the unstable bundle, then use the SRB measure. Here you need to assume a little bit of uh, more uh, differentiability because you want that potential to be held, otherwise it's not. But as you can see, we already have two cases, very important cases, very popular cases, a lot of research going on in this, in this part of the theory. Okay? So what is the main idea of the proof? The main idea of the proof is the following. You use Markov partitions and you reduce your system to a subshift of finite type. You study the subshift of finite type and then you go back to the manifold using the semiconjugacy. That's nice and everything, but you need the Markov partition in the full generality that I wrote, at least. You can do it for some cases without passing through the Markov partition, but not for all of them. As one can expect, since this is a foundational theorem, there are a lot of generalizations and people working on that. And I'm going to just highlight the case of and also flows, and I'm not going to go further. Okay? This is, again, seen a Royal Bowen, essentially. It's maybe a Royal and Bowen. Let me remark the following. Some hyperbolicity is usually required for the general census. You either assume something about your map, or some part of the map, or you assume something for the potential. And in the next week, you are going to have a course by Yuri, which he's going to assume a very mild uh, condition of hyperbolicity, and he's going, he's going to work with that, to obtain uh, a mark of partitions in some sense and work with, get the equilibrium states. All right. And now, let me discuss an ex important example where the available methods fail. Those are diagonal actions on locally homogeneous spaces. I'm going to rely here on the course of Professor Mohammadi, which I've seen that you have been discussing diagonal actions, at least on quotients of SL and R. I'm not going to work in the most general setting. I'm just going to content myself with giving you one example. Take the free SL free R and take the diagonal group, the matrices with positive entries, the subgroup of, of G. And consider a co-compact torsion free lattice there in G. That means you already know what co-compact lattice means. Torsion free means you can think it in the algebraic way. For me, what is important is that G mod gamma is a manifold. You may not even need that, but let's assume that. 
Then you have a natural action of the diagonal group on the quotient, which is a manifold. And this is an enough of action. And what is an enough of action? There exists an element, at least one element, not all of them, but at least one element that leaves an splitting of that form, ES plus EC plus EU invariant. And for some metric, DF in EU is expansion. EU is an unstable bundle, of course. DF restricted to ES is a contraction. And EC is tangent to the orbits of the action. Okay? Now, in the orbit of the action, you are essentially a translation. You are a multiplication by a group element. So in there, you don't have any hyperbolicity. Okay? Okay. So essentially what I say is it's a little bit of an exercise, but not too hard, that you can choose the metric in M such that F as, as an isometry on the orbit foliation. And then you say that F is a center isometry, and the definition should be evident. So you have three bundles, ES, EC, plus EU. In ES, you contract, EU, you expand, and on EC, you are an isometry. Okay? Uh, the differential is an isometry. Okay? Now, what is the difference? That you may interchange leaves. In the, leaf foli in the orbit foliation of, of um, a new group action, the leaves are fixed. Here, you may change them. Okay? So this is an example, and this is an example of partial hyperbolic dynamical systems. And again, the remark that I was trying to make is you don't have any probability on the center. You are in isometry. Any invariant measure, you look at the Lyapunov exponents restricted to the center, they are zero. You are not going to get any hyperbolicity. This is just some general facts. Believe me that this is true. All those bundles are integrable. ES, EU, EC, EC, EC plus ES, EC plus EU, which are center stable and center unstable. And you can integrate it by its center F invariant foliations, which I'm going to denote uh, W star, where star is U, C, F, U, C, C, S, or C. And now I'm going to state my, our main theorems. Suppose that you have a center isometry of class C2. And assume that W, the stable and the unstable are minimal, that is, all leaves are dense. This is the topological mixing condition that I was talking in, in the previous theorem. Okay? And suppose that you're given a holder potential. Then the following happens. You can find a me uh, an invariant measure and families of measures along the unstable, the stable, the center stable, and the center unstable, which satisfies the following. Well, the probability nu phi is an equilibrium state. And for every x, the measure, say, look at the, the measure in each unstable leaf, you put a random measure. And you say, do the same in the, every stable leaf, and you do the same in every center stable leaf, and every center unstable leaf. Those are given. That's a part of the theory. And it has some properties. So if you have a measurable partition that refines, that means that the atoms are conditioned, conditioned to the unstable leaves, say, the conditionals of the, your equilibrium state are equivalent to new U x. Here I mean the following. Say, suppose that you have U foliation. You take a box and you apply Fubini and you get measures here. Okay? Those measures are going to be, after normalization, are going to be proportional for some positive function to the new ux and new u, uh, to the new ux. So here, is, here is this partition. I look at the conditional measure here. This is equivalent to new x. Okay? Then, some other properties for every epsilon sufficient and small. If you look at the ball or size, the center of effects in size epsilon, you have protein structure with respect to the unstable and the center stable. That is, that your measure there is equivalent to a product. And then you have what is called the Gibbs property. But let me be precise here. 
Consider epsilon. Take for x epsilon n, look at the following. You look at the points in the local stable manifold of x such that the distance from x to y are less than epsilon for the n first iterates. This is just the intersection of the n epsilon bow and ball of x with respect to the local unstable of x epsilon. And then the measure of that set is comparable to the Birkhoff sum of phi of x minus n topolog uh, topological entropy of phi. Okay? So you come for every n. That's for every n. The bounds depend on epsilon, but they don't depend on n, neither do they depend on x. This is called the Gibbs property. Yes? Is this in the unstable manifold? What they did I write wrong? Ah, yes, 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 sorry. Yes, thank you. Yes, I, I, yes, absolutely right. It's a new UX, sure. Now, what happens? Why I'm writing that? I'm writing that because of the following. Along the center, you are going to have diversions because you are a symmetry. Each time that you add a bit of sum, two points, in the, the difference of between two points, this difference is going to maintain forever. So you're not going to be able to get something like this. You get something which is exponential with n. But that's the term coming from the center, which we already know that you have. So you have that. Now, let me give you, discuss a couple of more properties. F is a center isometry, C2. And center stable and unstable and the stable are uh, minimal. This is a central isometry. So you act, it's a partially hyperbolic, and in the center you act as an isometry. And in the center isometry. So you can think of the regular element of, a, of an anosov action. That's, uh, that's my main interest, Stefan. So let me now discuss Bernoulli, which should be Bernoulli, Bernoulli property and uniqueness. Yes, time, one of, time t of Anderson flows. Yes, precisely. So along this, you have unstable, stable, and along the flow direction, you are an isometry. For Anderson flow, it was already done. But you need to pass through the Markov partition. That's uh, Bowen and uh, that's essentially Bowen. And but he gets Markov partition for the flow, not for the time t's. The Markov partition is for the flow. No, it's the flow. It's for the autonomy of the flow. In fact, uh, if you want, I'll discuss you in the end. But this, for the, the, if you want, it for the case of flows, is no. The problem is higher rank actions. Now, let me, there are a couple of conditions that it will tell me, uh, it will lead me astray, so I don't want to mention what are the conditions that I need, but if you put a couple of conditions, simple conditions, you get that you metric, uh, your system is metrically isomorphic to Arnoldi shift. Okay? And what about uniqueness? Well, assume either that the dimension of the stable and the unstable is one, or that you have an ergodic automorphism of the torus. That's another example. Ergodic automorphism of the torus are partially hyperbolic, and in the central direction you act as a essentially isometry. Well, it should be an isometry, I guess. I should put an ergodic automorphism of the torus such that irreducible, maybe. Uh, then the equilibrium state is unique. And what is working process, what we are doing, what we are almost, almost complete, maybe, <laughs> is that uniqueness also holds in the homogeneous cases. For example, the weight chamber flow, if you know what it means. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to, how, how much time do I have? Five minutes. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. Let me then speed out a little bit. Let me remind you a couple of things of SRB measures. 
In the general settings, an SRV measure is a measure which is absolutely has unstable conditionals, absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. This can be made precise in very general framework. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to work, keep working with central isometries. But here you have two important uh, works which tell you what is the behavior of these type of measures. And the first is SRV measure exists. And this is due to the foundational work of Sinai and Pessin. In principle, that's not obvious at all. For the hyperbolic, you have the Markov partition. For other systems, you don't. But they exist. And the other thing is that are the sophisticated, sophisticated argument of Le Drapier and Young, that if your measure is an SRV measure, if and only if the entropy of F is the logarithm of the unstable, is the logarithm of the unstable Jacobian. Now, take everything to a side. That is that if the entropy, that's passing uh, formula, so you have equality in passing formula. If you have, um, you put everything to, to the left, so you have that NS mu uh, has absolutely, con uh, in, uh, absolutely continuous uh, conditional measures along unstable, if and only if the entropy minus the logarithm, the, inter the, the, the integral of minus the logarithm is zero. So it's a zero, it's a equilibrium state for that potential. Okay, that's what I wrote in the beginning. And here I'm using, very in, using implicitly that unstable manifolds coincide with passing unstable manifold. There are no uh, expansion whatsoever along the center. All invariant measure has zero Lyapunov exponents along the center. So let me try at least to, to tell you what is the theorem that we are proving, or we have proved, which is you have a similar characterization of what are equilibrium states in terms of the measures. So you have the following. Nu is an equilibrium state for your potential phi if and only if your conditionals along unstables are equivalent to nu u. Those are the families that we constructed along the unstables. And now, a measure, an invariant measure, is an uh, equilibrium state if and only if, if you disintegrate, you look at the conditionals, those are equivalent to new. This is, well, let me go to the, this, complete the theorem and make some remarks. This, so you have this thing for the stables. So the conditionals along the stable should be in US. And conversely, if you have an invariant measure which has conditionals absolutely continuous respect to new, new U, then new is an equilibrium state. And in particular, they are uh, equivalent to new, the conditionals are equivalent, and along the stables you also know them. Okay? So if you think about this, this is a complete analog of the case SRV. Your equilibrium, you have, you know the disintegration along the stables, and you characterize the equilibrium state. You can here, in this case, uh, what is the, the point is that these families, they provide you the reference measures to which you can compare. For the SRV, you already have Lebesgue. Lebesgue is always there. But for this case, in principle, that was unknown, right? What do you compare? Well, you compare with new U and new S. Those, that's what you compare. And this, I think it is even new for the case of anosophy geomorphism. This, there was that characterization is, I, I haven't seen it anywhere else. So I don't pro, and probably I don't have too much time, I guess, right? A couple of minutes to go into the proof? No, maybe not. Maybe not. Let me see if I have. I don't think that I'm going to. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. I'd rather leave it here than 